Good morning. Good morning, bonjour. Salamat pagi. This is our external brain. Right? It's our second brain. And for some of our kids, it's the first brain. Right? Now this is going to move here, and then it's going to move here, and then if Elon Musk has his way, it's going to move here. Right? This machine will be a million times as powerful as it is today in 10 years. And the battery will last six weeks. Right? And we'll have 9 billion people on the internet in 2030. The numbers are staggering, so I'm going to talk to you about what technology means today, where things are going, and I always like to say technology is going to change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. I know it sounds crazy, you know, Industrial Revolution, World War II, the atomic bomb, right? But now technology is changing us. Genomic engineering, changing the weather, right? Artificial intelligence, thinking machines, that's quite different than a steam engine. You know, or, or the railway. So we're moving into a world where this is the new normal. Humans talking to machines, machines overlapping in our tasks, machines telling us what to do, machines running our elections. Just kidding, now that was a different time. But the question is, how far do we want to go with this? I mean, if you can be superhuman, would you not want to be superhuman? I mean, I'm German. But I spent 17 years in the US. And the answer is pretty clear for a lot of people. Yeah, if I can be like becoming like God, so to speak, yeah, if I can be superhuman, why not? <laughs> and guess what? It will make a lot of money to be superhuman. I mean, it's clear you're going to be, have an advantage. So who decides what is the right thing to do? We're living in a world of algorithms, right? an algorithmic society. That's money is going digital, right? algorithmic society. We're living in a world where machines can do some of the thinking, where the data economy is king, right? Some people call that the surveillance economy. And imagine when money goes digital, we're going to have even more of this. And then there's the things that on the other side, I call them the Android rhythms in my book. The human things. When we talk about intelligence with humans, we're not talking about processing power. We're talking about emotional intelligence, social intelligence. Did you know that the research has shown that emotional intelligence is mostly embodied by women right? today right? in a much larger way than men? I think Jack Ma said, you know, that's our future is to get the EQ. Right? And psychologists have said that humans have about 10 different kinds of intelligence. And what kind of intelligence does a machine have? We'll talk about that later in our discussion. A machine has a binary intelligence, yeah? zeros and ones, data, figures, logic. This is our intelligence. I don't want a machine that does this. And why do we need it? We are very good at this. Compassion, emotions, creativity, machines are not. So here's the thing, of course you know that basically replacing humanity makes a lot of money. Look at the uh, profits of big tech. The most powerful companies in the world today are not banks or oil companies. Right? They're tech companies. And they're also the most unre unregulated. Right? Incidentally, so very powerful what's happening here. I mean, the stats are really quite clear. We have algorithms, technology, and then we have algorithms, purpose, curiosity, passion, imagination. That's what, what defines us. And what is the overlap? Will we still have passion or purpose when things are run by a machine? I always say, you know, relationships aren't downloads, and happiness is not on a screen. I mean, it's funny these days, people have more relationships with their screens than they have with people. I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here. So I like to, you know, as a summary, say, and for this part of my presentation, I think societies are driven by that tech and their science, but defined by humanity. Imagine a society that is driven by technology but has no humanity in the sense of ethics, values, ideas, what we want, right? That would be extremely scary. So that's something we have to think about, which way we're going, and many people are arguing that humans are essentially technology. We can take a vote on this later, <laughs> but you know, being German, I don't believe that. I live in Switzerland now, same difference. 
But in the US, I keep hearing this argument, organisms are algorithms. We are fancy computers. So in that case, convergence of the two doesn't really touch us. A lot of people say that this is basically what's going to happen because you know, computers will take over our work, they will take over our government, they'll run our climate change efforts, and we become useless. I don't know how you feel about this. I don't think humans are going to be useless. If you're looking at this chart, you can clearly see what's happening with jobs and AI. Yes, many jobs will go away because of technology. Right? Many other jobs will be boosted. For example, all the jobs in healthcare, in scientific, and communications. And what are those jobs? Right? Ask yourself what those jobs are. They're human-only jobs. Right? They're jobs that we do because we're human. Look at the, when I zoom in, you can clearly see these jobs are not entirely just logic, right? They're about us as people. So important to consider what's happening here, the percentage of human-only work. That's where all of us are going. Human-only work means we give the work that can't be done by machines, which is increasingly more. We give that to the robots and the software, and we move up the food chain. That will not be an easy transformation for a taxi driver or a call center leader. Again, as Jack Ma has said, is the balance between EQ and IQ. If you want to have a job in the future, you got to boost your, your EQ, right? your emotional quotient. Assuming that you already have an IQ, that's why you're here. Right? But you know, this is something that is quite clear that's going to happen. Oh, you know, our kids, you think about our kids, what do they really have to learn in the future? They have to be entrepreneurs, they have to invent, they have to understand people, they have to know how to have feelings. They have to beat the machines, not by being faster than the machine. That's ridiculous, right? In 10 years, we can't beat the machines for anything. Technology is coming. We're not going to go back on it and put it back in the box. This is the most important part when we talk about technology and humanity. It's not to reject technology. I mean, the idea of saying that we, we, we have a risk, so we're not going to do this, is, is odd, right? But then so is the idea of saying, well, anything we can do, we should do. So let's all put holes into our skull and connect to the internet. Yeah. That's also a bad idea. So it's about the balance and you know, who decides the balance. That will be the biggest challenge. Automation. I mean, the financial industry, you know that many of our jobs are going to be automated because machines are learning them. Right? Christine Lagarde said, automation is good for growth, but bad for equality. And that's a fact. And we're going to have increasingly automation, call centers, bookkeepers, accounting, auditing, you know, half of KPMG, automated, maybe. So that's a question, right? What did we do about this? And, and who is going to be in charge of equality? So in this world, you know, there's also the side effect of what technology does, which is to make us you know, dependent on it. Right? I think when you think of this image, what do you think of? Right? What do you think of? social media. <laughs> uh, we're, we're in this world where we're being pulled by strings and we don't even know they exist. Right? To which I like to say too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. Like drugs. Do we not allow alcohol because people may drink too much? Yeah, we, we have restrictions, right? But we allow it. We have coffee, we have cigarettes, we have pipes, you know, whatever you can think of. You know, we're even legalizing marijuana now. And now, too much of a good thing is a very bad thing, because when you do too much, you know, end up in a bad place. So let me talk about this really important thing when it's about technology. We're, in a, we're living in a world where technology is giving us amazing deals on convenience, on content, on communication. Life is better because of technology. And these companies here are the ones furnishing it to a large degree, at right? the top eight in the world. American and Chinese. But on the other end of the fantastic magic offering, we do have some issues. Right? I call these the externalities. Right? These externalities are, are as important as the externalities of oil and gas, which is climate change. Now we have tax avoidance, we have dehumanization, manipulation. We have to address the externalities of technology. How do we do that? Well. Here's a suggestion, we should do this, right? We should have a group of people in every city, in every industry, and in every country, and globally, there'll be a lot of people, call this a digital ethics council. 
uh, people whose job it is to think about what the consequences of technology are and how we deal with them. I'm not talking about politicians or CEOs here, right? I'm talking about thinkers. I'm talking about people that would be on the level where they can be like, you know, Socrates kind of thing. And this is happening in, in Singapore. It's happening in Denmark. It's happening in different industries. It's happening at Microsoft. It's happening at Google. It's a very, very important discussion. Digital ethics is knowing the difference between what technology enables you to do and what is the right thing to do. Now, I grant you that is a difficult discussion about what is the right thing to do, right? I mean, who decides? We'll talk about that in the panel. I'm sure we'll solve it very quickly. Here's a short example. Facebook is the new cigarettes. It's not good for you. It's addictive. You don't know who's trying to convince you to use it or misuse it. The government has to step in and regulate it. And Facebook has proven that to us, even since I said it over nine months ago, over and over and over again, that they need to be regulated because they're not self-regulating. Mark Benioff from Salesforce, right? They need to regulate, be regulated because they're not self-regulating. Think about that for a second. I mean, you're in the banking business, right? He heavily regulated. Do we need this for these platforms? Absolutely. Right? And that discussion is raging because we don't want to end up here, right? You know, we want to end up in a place where AI can help us build value, right? not become the panoptic, the global panopticon. And here's the key question in that. Who is mission control, right? Who controls what happens? Right now, the sector, the top 20 companies in the world are largely uncontrolled. Right? I mean, more, more uncontrolled than any other industry ever was, and this is a very, very big issue. So going forward, yeah, this is one of the key issues that we're talking about, and which way are we going to go with this? You know, we have sort of the externalities of climate change, right? and then we have the second pollution, which is digital. I call this a digital pollution. Yeah, it's, it's a way of you know, messing up our thinking and thinking about stuff that we should rather do differently. Best example, really, is Facebook in their efforts of uh, undermining democracy. Yeah. And it's funny, you can't say that they did it by purpose or that they are criminal. Yeah. You signed the user agreement, yeah. but it's unethical. Yeah. And that is the problem, of course, with technology when we think about what this means and you know, how they are working on keeping us addicted to the feed of technology. Is that unethical? I think it is. Yeah. I don't know what your view is on this. I'm, I'm certain none of you do any of those things anyway. So AI, right? same topic. In principle, it's a great idea. I call this intelligent assistance, IA. That's what, you know, in banking, financial, that's 98% of you. They're just fancy software, right? These machines are not thinking. They're not learning like we do, right? They think like machines. How does a machine think? Zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, binary. You know, it basically, if this, then that, right? They can learn, yes, but not like us. I mean, a human sees the world like this. A machine sees the world like this, but has no limits on seeing it, right? There's quite a different level of things. And I think in this world, we should be very careful what we wish for. Intelligent assistance, artificial intelligence, yes, but at the end, ASI, artificial general intelligence, AGI, Ah, no, 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 that's probably not a good idea. I think we need to really figure out you know, how we're going to discuss what we do here. I think we're going to see a moratorium on this, just like we have on nuclear weapons. And I, that will not be an easy task, just like nuclear weapons. So let me wrap up, and I think we're moving into a world that I call this hell then. Yeah? It could be heaven, it could be hell. And this has nothing to do with technology or Silicon Valley or China. Right? It has to do with how we govern technology. Right? Whether technology is used to dehumanize or to rehumanize, it's not the purpose of technology to decide. Technology is neutral until we use it. Right? It's not good or bad. We make it good or bad. And we have to think about how we govern technology, not just like government, but also in terms of our own use and which way we're going with this. So this is kind of quite clear, you know, in this world, between the good and the bad of technology, what are you going to do? Say, well, don't touch it, yeah? Uh, you're going to have to ask a different question. The question is not if we can do something or how we do it or how much money it makes. That question is getting to be an old question. This is the only question. Why? 
what's the purpose? When we have digital money, and we will, why? You know, what's the purpose? And who can we trust? Would you trust a social media company with your money? That social media company? Yeah, nice idea, but you know, I don't have the trust. I don't know about you, but I think it's a very, very big discussion. Right? In this world, everything that we do is moving to the cloud. Everything. Healthcare records, music, films, television, books, banking, insurance, uh, transportation, cloud. Right? If we don't put this in the middle, human purpose, that's not going to be a good future. We have to make sure that the companies that do this adhere to a standard. Right? They actually are doing this in what I call the, the, uh, the three future principles, holistic business models, the circular economy, and humans at the center. I will not do business with any bank that doesn't have those three parameters. And that will be the new normal also in the stock market in the very near future. So I'm going to wrap up saying, you know, as I say in my book, the biggest danger today is not that machines will take over and kill us. There is a danger for that. It's pretty far away. Well, in overall terms, you know, 50 years maybe. Right? That is possible. Today, the biggest problem is that we become like the machines. We look at the customer as if they were an algorithm. We're too lazy to do our own things. Right? We forget who we are. We stop listening. Right? And we basically become technology. So my call to you is to say, let's embrace technology and use it for all the stuff that it's good for, but not become technology. And I think this is also where Europe and the UK has a leg up. So we'll discuss it in the panel. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Good morning. Well, Gerd told me he was going to do this event, and he wanted to represent the side of humanity. So he said, would you come along and represent the robots for me and fight against humanity? And of course, I'm not going to do that. I am in favor of humanity. I'm a big fan of it. But I want to tell you that the predictions that we've heard, well, Gerd's been reincarnated from some earlier eras because his message is not a new one. The world we live in is changing and is new in every way. But at the same time, this question is very old. And this question of whether we have and hell, well, I'm sure they debated it around these stones saying, this is going to give us a calendar, and we're going to have to do things on certain dates, and we're going to, you know, it's going to tell us when to have our big parties, and I think that's going to change what it means to be human. But of course, we've gotten used to the calendars. We've moved forward to discuss this here in this city of slightly larger edifices that we stand among. Nonetheless, this debate goes back to the very earliest days. This debate about heaven or hell is not a dichotomy. It isn't an escalator going one way or an escalator going up. The reality is we're going to see both heaven and hell, and we're going to try and make the best of it. We're never going to get a perfectly good world or a perfectly evil world. Now, the first big decision that we had to make when we had this debate was this big question of, should we come down from the trees? Because if we come down from the trees, will we lose our monkeyness, right? Are we going to stop being monkeys? Are we going to, to lose all the things that we value that make us monkeys? Well, of course we did. And we got humanity instead, and we don't seem to regret the decision, although I occasionally do run into people who do. We also must have had this debate over fire. Now, this is a slightly more modern version of fire for those of you who've been to Burning Man. But once again, we didn't know what was happening. We argued about it. And we ended up liking the result in the long run. I actually do hear people today who debate whether agriculture was a good idea. Actually, before agriculture, as you know, we were hunter-gatherers. Uh, some people think that lifestyle was very idyllic, and you didn't have as many warlords, and you didn't have kings and all those other things. But by and large, agriculture, which has fed the world, seems to have been a pretty good decision. And then the Industrial Revolution began, first in textiles here in Bath, and then later with industrial technology and iron, also here in the United Kingdom. And this is the one we often debate the most, and yet it's the reason we are all here. So what do we do about this? How do we answer this question when, the, when we're talking about machines that think, cars that drive themselves, robots that act as people do or do things that people do? The answer is that 
we have a very difficult time telling the difference between foresight and hindsight. All of the arguments that were made about these other th great decisions, great singularities of the past, turned out to be wrong. The people who said don't do it, at least as far as I think most people in this room would conclude, turned out to be wrong, but we didn't know at the time how to decide. We didn't know how to decide what was wrong and what was right. Now the change of pace, the pace of change, is obviously faster and accelerating today. The chart that you see on the left is a chart of the price of computing per dollar. And this chart was put together by Ray Kurzweil and uh, Catherine Myronic. And this is an exponential chart, which means that each dot on the left axis is 10 times bigger than the dot before. And they noticed when they built this chart that if you plotted it back all the way to the beginning of the 20th century in 1900, it stayed on an exponential curve for now 100, more than 120 years. You don't see the Second World War, the Great Depression on this chart. You don't see anything that people have tried to change about it or do anything about it or anything else that humans have done deliberately over the course of this history. It's happening and it's continuing to happen. And we're now seeing, of course, the average company on the Fortune 500 lasting a little more than 20 years instead of 80 years as it used to. And on the right, you see a picture of the first digital camera invented by the Kodak company. That company took a look at that digital camera in their boardroom and said, uh, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. We sell paper and chemicals. That's what Kodak does. Why do we want to make a digital camera? They decided not to sell it. And of course, they went bankrupt. The same year they went bankrupt, Instagram, which knew what photography was actually about, which was sharing memories with your friends, was sold for a billion dollars with 13 employees. Now, that's the dramatic story of how much things have changed that 13 people created something that was worth a billion dollars. That's happened now several times since then. But that Kodak couldn't see it, and it's because we're very bad at predicting when the world changes like this. How will we be good at regulating? How will we be good at deciding what the ethics will be when we are so bad at predicting? It is one thing to work out what the ethics should be about things we've had for a decade, things like nuclear weapons, and even things like Facebook, which we've now had for a decade. It's very, very difficult to think about what the ethics should be of things that barely exist, and to even call for moratoriums on them, as has been suggested. Now, there is a long history of this. Long before the talk you just saw this morning, here you can see cartoons and books going back to 1878, where people put out this call. They said machines are going to replace people, it's going to cause tremendous disruption and upset in our society. And we're going to have to do something about it. Now, they didn't actually figure out what to do about it. But all the people who called for holding back, so far, we think they were wrong. We think that our society has generally progressed and been pretty good. And there's a lot of charts which back that up as more than just intuition. Here's my favorite example. In fact, we discovered this example when a group of us held a conference on the future of computers and jobs and the question of whether or not uh, computers would take all the jobs and what we should do, and we agreed that it was a very serious issue that needed a lot of analysis and discussion, and that maybe our group, which had various erudite people as well as myself, should write a letter to the president, because we all know the story of Einstein writing a letter to the president long ago about nuclear weapons in, during the Second World War. And so someone at the back of the room said, we don't need to write the letter. Somebody already wrote it. I found it. It begins, Dear President Johnson. So in 1964, the Triple Revolution letter warned about these three revolutions, the Cyber Nation Revolution, as they termed it then, the Weaponry and Human Rights Re Revolutions. So here we go with people saying, people in 1964, think about what computers were like in 1964. Just Step back, even if you're not that old, you probably have some idea of what they were compared to the computers you have today. They were scared to death of those computers in 1964. And if we go back, the book from 1984, that's when an early Apple Mac was the best computer you could buy for yourself. And it was going to be drastic change. So this is our history of predicting. It's not a great one. And it is no small risk to get these predictions wrong. And this is the issue we must face. Everyone sees that there are problems because there are problems. But how do you figure out how to decide? How do we try and understand 
that even though we see in hindsight what we might have done better in the Industrial Revolution, what we might have done better in the Agrarian Revolution, what we might have done better even in coming down from the trees, in hindsight we see that. We can know what it is. But it is impossible as far as I can tell or figure out how to figure out who were the people who were right in those days if we could have listened to them. Because I'm not saying that nobody saw the problems that we now know about in hindsight. There were the Luddites who said, you know, we don't want, we want to smash the machines, they're going to cause this social challenge. They turned out to be wrong. There were other people who were right. We actually have metaphors for all these type of predictors, right? We have Cassandra, who is right, but no one believes her. And so there always are some Cassandras in every change and revolution, every singularity, who are right, but we have not listened to them in the past, and there's no evidence we're going to suddenly start listening to them in the future. There are chicken littles, of course, who say everything is falling down, and they're wrong, but sometimes we listen to them. And we have boys who cry wolf who lie that something wrong is going on, and then we finally ignore them. What I couldn't find was a metaphor for people who keep saying that bad things are going to happen, and they're wrong every time, but finally the time comes that they're right, and we regret that we didn't listen to them. The closest thing was the boy who cries wolf. Well, these uh, problems, as I've shown you, have taken place throughout our history. And every time we've felt something really bad was going to happen, and every time we've been wrong. And every time, even the most recent times where we said, and by the way, we've been wrong every time before, but this time it's different, and this time again we were wrong. So how do we figure out how to be right? Well, we all are not particularly fond of this gentleman and what his company has done. There's no question about that. And so people say, why should this guy who built Facebook be in charge of what Facebook does? Because his interest is in making money and his interest is in building his user base and all these other things. It's not the public interest. But if we are to have another decision-making process for how his company and the other companies will run, exactly who will we trust to have the foresight other than the man who built it, not that he's anywhere near perfect? Are we going to ask for the crowd, the public, voters, mobs? Will they be the ones to make the right decision? Will courts be the ones who make the decision about how our technology runs? Now, many people say, why don't we get governments? Uh, because we can certainly trust the people who run the governments in order to solve these problems and decide things. Now, I think I've figured out the answer, which is, of course, we should have bankers. But uh, I thought that would get a better hand here, perhaps. Uh, no, it's not the bankers either. We don't know who it is. And we already are transhuman. I think those monkeys that came down from the trees certainly wouldn't recognize us. And even the people at Stonehenge, I don't think, would recognize us as human and our lives as human. And we don't love humanity nearly as much as we imagine. In the natural human state, I would have been dead a long time ago, I'm afraid. I've taken the services of the medical establishment a couple of times, as many of you have. And so much of our lives in the past without the natural human life was you know, nasty, brutish, and short, as Hobbes said. We don't want to be natural humans. We want to be that. In fact, I'm going to ask you a question that may be central to all of this. Because Gerd put up a lot of different attributes about human thinking and style and said, these are the things that make us human. I'm going to tell you what I think is most special about humans. We are the one species that wants to be better than we are. We want to improve ourselves. We want to change ourselves to make us not change, to make us not become inhuman from our definition. That would be inhuman. That would be making us what we are not. Stopping, relinquishing, that would be the challenge. And yet, we already can see this in our generations. My father, you know, he thought this stuff was all crazy. My nephew on the left, he, you know, uses it as part of his daily life, and my nephew on the right says, you mean things are different? They don't have any concept that anything has gone bad or wrong or is different from what they imagine it to be. For us to relinquish these technologies is a huge decision. All right, we're talking about technologies that will save billions of lives, not millions of lives, that will end disease, that could end scarcity, that could bring education to all, that could reverse climate change and give us the exploration of space to give us the resources we have so everyone can lead a good life. 
That's a lot to relinquish because we're scared of the ethics. We must be sure we do this right. And if we do relinquish, if we say that there should be a moratorium on AI, I can tell you that this country here is working very hard and investing very heavily in building AI technology. And so if there is no European AI or American AI, there will be Chinese AI. And I'm not saying the Chinese are evil. I'm not saying that they're going to you know, be nasty overlords through the world. But they will have different ethics and different principles. There is no choice about whether this happens. The only choice is how we make it happen. And the only way to do this is not to say no to it, but to say, as in improvisation people say, yes and. This is going to happen, and we can maybe figure a way to do it better. Thank you very much. We're now going to move into uh, a fireside chat to delve a little bit deeper into uh, the issues. Um, so, Brad, you argue that uh, you know we we need to lend progress, uh, you know, technology go ahead, and that it could be dangerous or misguided to try to govern it before we even know what it can do. And um, Gerd, you are proposing uh, data ethics councils. Um, don't you think we have to draw a line before we, we unleash all of this, especially if you're right and uh, indeed uh, we will be changing uh, humanity more in the next uh, 20 years than we have in the last 300? Are there more dangers? Do we, are we, uh, should we really make sure that uh, we know what we're doing before we unleash this technology? Yeah, well, th this is not a black or white decision, right? You guys drink coffee, you smoke cigarettes, you drink alcohol, many of us. You're not saying, well, in principle, I never touch any of that. Some people do, but most people don't. But if you drank a bottle of brandy before you go to work in the morning, a lot of people wouldn't approve of it. So the question of technology is exactly the same question. We, we use technology for the things that we need it done. We use IA and maybe AI, but we should not use AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence, because when we go on a level that is exponentially so much further out than we are currently at, there's a loss of control, there's application, there's all kinds of issues, we don't agree on anything. So what I'm saying is not to go backwards, not to do any of those things. I'm saying we need to figure out what do we want from technology. I think Tim Cook said uh, three months ago at the European Commission, he said, uh, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want to do anything. And if we want technology to do great things, we have to make technology do great things. And we have to agree on what that is. Is living to be 200 years old a great thing? Is having super soldiers a great thing? Is beating cancer a great thing? I would say yes. So this is what it comes down to. That's, that's my proposition. So, yeah, um, Brad, <clears throat> you know, we, if, if AI has the chance or other technologies has the chance to help us um, eradicate poverty, solve climate change, significantly improve human health, of course, we have to go ahead. But when we've introduced new game-changing technologies like the internet, which you have helped pioneer, we came up with a governing system that was different than just government or some other thing. We came up with ICANN, right? It was a, a new, yeah. well, I'm not saying it's perfect, but we came up with a new type of way to kind of check how things are, are, are going to be implemented. Um, can't we try something new, uh, like a data ethics council, without uh, hurting the benefits of the technology? So I have no problem with people discussing. In fact, I strongly approve of ethics councils to sit and examine the ethical issues and make sure people are aware of them and make sure the people building the technology both participate in the discussions and are aware of the issues and that we do it in concert with an understanding of society. That's absolutely fantastic. The question is when you get to the next level, which is to say that we're going to have decision making, we're going to have moratoriums, we're going to have companies broken up, we're going to do that. That is the thing we have to be very careful about. When we start saying, you can't do this, and we have a disagreement about whether you should or shouldn't do this, and someone has to decide whether we should or shouldn't do it, that is where the, the really hard challenge lies. But 
Can I chime in? I think you know, it's quite clear in the next 10, maybe 20 years, technology will be virtually unlimited in power. You know, quantum computing, 5G, what have you. And at that point, it's just as important that we decide on what we want to use it for as if we had decided what climate change does, you know, 10 years ago. We didn't, right? So, but we are not one entity. Right? Exactly. There are some people who are going to want to use it for this and other people who want to use it for that. The question comes when one side says the other side must not use it for that. Well, right now we're in a situation when it comes to AI and ethics where we have literally dozens of different uh, groups and organizations who are working on AI and ethics and guidelines. And most of them are um, controlled or were initiated by commercial interests. And Gerd, you have said in the past, you know, you've asked the question, are we comfortable with handing mission control for humanity to Silicon Valley? You know, do we want overworked programmers who are rushing to push out products be, uh, to, to um, satisfy the shareholders make these kind of important decisions? Um, on the other hand, companies have got to take responsibility because we will get to a, a point where the companies will not be able to 100% predict what the AI they unleash does. And this, this uh, actually exposes companies to, um, to, to, to lawsuits uh, and all kinds of other things. So what's the best way forward? How do we make sure that we make the best use of technology, but also protect society and even protect business itself? I think first, uh, the story of the future, what the future is, should be taken away from the discussion of, of technology and Silicon Valley and China on that level. It should be given back to people and citizens and hopefully governments and thinkers, taken away from, you know, if you talk about AI, AI you talk about IBM. If you talk about quantum computing, you talk about Microsoft. And, and they make the story of the future. And that's great, but it's not enough because they are profit, they're companies for profit, and they, it's none of their concern what the pollution of their product is, so to speak, right? Uh, even so though they do start talking about it. I have to challenge you on that, and I was one of the people who helped convince Sergey Brin that they should not collaborate with the Chinese and the repression of the Chinese people in providing information, and he made that decision, and it was a very expensive and difficult decision for him to make, which has probably cost him more money than most of the companies in this room have ever made. Uh, there are people making ethical decisions and having ethical thoughts in these organizations. They're not these monoliths that you necessarily describe. In fact, perversely, the ones that are led by individuals like Sergey Brin and Mark Zuckerberg and, and uh, Bill Gates and so on, they actually are the ones that, uh, that get the time to think about this. I, I agree with you on this. I mean, I, and I, I've met many of people who are of that nature. I just think the last two or three years, we've had a bit of a mind change on this. Yeah. Before that, technology companies, who are my clients to a large degree, their mission is to say, you know what, we make it work, we sell the Internet of Things, and what people do with the Internet of Things is none of our business. And that is a very, very bad proposition. That's like the gun companies saying, you know, people kill people, guns don't kill people, right? I mean, the most ridiculous excuse for unaccountability you can imagine. Don't use that argument in the United States, by the way. Because <laughs> it's pretty well, no, I get shot. So I think, uh, I, I think the one thing that perhaps we could all agree on is that the future does not have to be dystopian. Technology is shaping the future, but so are we. So is society, so is business. And together, we have to decide um, what kind of world we want to live in and then help shape the technology to ensure that that's the kind of future that I mean, we want. I, I'm convinced the future is amazing. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. You know, you may have not seen it from the slides, but, yeah. but basically what is happening is like we, get, we will have all the tools we need to do amazing things and to solve all kinds of problems. Technology will not solve social, cultural, political problems. That'll be left to us. But humans have been actually quite good at once there's a reason, like nuclear bombs, right, to take action. What I think is going to happen, and I think it's unlikely to happen very soon that we'll have incidents, you know, for example, on AI or the IoT that will be very detrimental. And then we say, oh, wait a minute, now we, you know, now we have to do something. But I, uh, think, that's, I yeah. think that's a good thing. Right? I think that Facebook uh, doesn't understand when they build it that it will be used for propaganda and to manipulate elections. And I didn't know that. They very, there were very few Cassandras there who actually warned about that. And the people who built Facebook didn't know it. And now we see that. 
and now people are working very hard to fix it. And I actually think that's the system working. I think demanding that somehow an ethics council would have figured out the propaganda dangers of Facebook when it was being built and modified it to avoid them, I think that's a very improbable uh, it, it depends solution. on the price that we're going to pay, you know. I mean, I, I predict that if Facebook doesn't really change in the next two or three years, we're going to see a major incident, not like election manipulation, but up a notch of a thousand, you yeah? know. And if that happens, then we're going to say, oh, God, now we have to do something. But if something happens with AI, and we may have a loss of a million human lives, you know, that, that's not something that we should necessarily take as a condition. Uh, that would be better if we didn't have to take that, you know. Uh, so my view is that a little bit of foresight would be a good thing to have. I picture a global council of Socrates kind of people. And, and they exist, right? We know who some of them are. So to put actual resources into this, not just to build technology, but not build humanity, you know, that, that's a very bad idea because we're going to end up in a world like this. Yeah? So I think that's a good note to, to end on since we're out of time. Right. But basically, I think the message here is don't, uh, don't put the brakes on technology, but think seriously about uh, the consequences. And with that, I'd like to ask you to give a, a big hand to our panelists. And let me just note first that GERD will be doing a book signing immediately following this session. So if you want to meet him and you want to get a copy of his book, please come, uh, come over to the side of the stage. Um, please give a big hand to our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>